in my first teaching position, 1990 something, um, uh, Jason uh, was uh, part of the school where I was teaching. He was in the first history class I taught. And uh, with time, we, we started growing closer together. I remember he went off and in, in, in after graduation, got involved in ministry in several different areas. But I remember distinctly uh, just, I think it was an ASI, it might have been Indianapolis, uh, came together and we just spent a lot of time and then hung out with his parents and something happened. Every now and then you meet a person who's a, a kindred spirit. Uh, and Jason has been that to me. Um, I won't give all the details, but he brings this side of me out that no one else does. Um, eventually, I joined Amazing Facts, and the first person I trained underneath was Jason. So Jason became my trainer. Uh, and I'm just very thankful that God has brought us full circle. I'm very thankful that uh, Jason is here. Midori, um, we spent a lot of time, she was an education major. I taught education, and we ended up spending time together in that way. And um, in the same way, I've also learned... Um, just like you watch our family, watch yours. And we just praise God for that. It's a ministry to us. So I'm thankful that Jason is here. When I found out that he was going to the mission field, there's been a burden in, in my heart always for the work that God's doing overseas because we have a worldwide church. Our church is not just here. Our church is not just in this conference or just in this division. It's a worldwide church. It's an incredible church. And I praise God for the work that's uh, going on. I deeply feel for our work here. But it's always been good to be reminded that we're part of a worldwide church. And Jason, uh, your decision as a family motivates me. I'm thankful that you can be here and share with us, brother. Yeah, hugs usually don't work out well for the PA guys. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath again. You know, there's few friends in life that stick with you through thick and thin. Amen. And Chuck has been one of those friends. I've had lots of other friends that have come and gone. Um, but you know, there's something special about having a friend who maybe you may not see them for a couple of years and maybe not talk to them for a long time. But then when you get back together again, you just pick up right where you left off. Yes. Isn't that a special thing? Yes. And uh, that's how Chuck and Christina's friendship has always been for us. We just kind of pick up where we left off and, and enjoy our time together. So it's a, it's a blessing to be here. It's been a long time since I've seen uh, you as a family, and the kids have just grown. Last time I saw Grace, she was still kind of crawling around on the ground, I think. Or maybe she was walking, I don't know. But she's got her head down. She's embarrassed. I won't embarrass her anymore. Um, so as you know, we're, we're heading off to the mission field. Papua New Guinea is where we're going to be going. I'll tell you a little bit more about that here in just a few moments. How many are familiar with Adventist Frontier Missions? All right, there's a, there's a number of you. Uh, I'm going to ask my family. They've got a little brochure that they're going to go ahead and uh, uh, pass out to you. This is just kind of a little overview of what we're going to be doing there. I'll tell you a little bit more about that here today. But the kids are going to go ahead and uh, pass that out. Um, how many of you get the Frontier Magazine? Anybody here get the Adventist Frontier Magazine? All right, there's a couple of you. You know, if you don't get the Adventist Frontier Magazine, and maybe I should ask the question, are you reading it? Because lots of us get magazines and then we never read them. I know I'm guilty of that. Um, but if you, if you don't get the Frontiers Magazine, and if you haven't had a chance to uh, read it, you're really missing out on something great. I mean, we've been reading the Frontiers Magazine for years, and the stories in there have just been a terrific blessing, just seeing how God providentially leads in people's life. We just read a story not too long ago, a couple in Africa, their, their, their source of water ran out, and God filled their water container five times miraculously without any water going into it. It's amazing stuff, right? I mean, the, the, water, the water that would fill it up, it stopped going. And they started praying. They said, Lord, we need water. They woke up in the morning, and their container was overflowing with water. Amen. We did that five times. 
right? So these are the types of stories that you hear in the Frontiers magazine. So you'll definitely want to uh, take a look at that if you get it in the mail. We have a clipboard, and when my wife is done kind of helping here with getting the brochures out, we're going to pass that clipboard around. And we want you to, if you'd like to, sign up for a free six-month subscription to the Frontiers magazine. I know I saw a couple of sample copies out there in the foyer. You could probably pick up one of those as well if you would like to. Um, just a little secret, if you want to get a free subscription to the Frontiers magazine, all you have to do is support a missionary. And that support can be as much as $5 a month or as much as, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month. It doesn't matter. But if you support a Frontier, Adventist Frontiers uh, missions or Adventist Frontiers uh, missionary, you will get a free subscription to the Frontiers magazine. But if you want a free su six-month subscription, we will send that in. Go ahead and sign up as the clipboard goes around here. Uh, we'll get that into AFM. Well, this morning I want to share with you a story. We all like stories, right? I'm going to share with you a story this morning, a story of God's miraculous leading and a story of God revealing his will in the life of my family. So before we begin, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me, and we will start with a brief word of prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful that we can come into your house of worship and worship this mighty God who calls us his children. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would rest upon this place. We ask that you would draw us nearer to you. And we pray, Father, that what you have brought us for here this morning will happen, that we will receive the blessing that you have prepared for us, and that you will take what is spoken, Lord, and apply it right where it needs to be in our hearts. So, Lord, we invite you to be with us here, and we thank you for chasing away any distractions so that we may focus upon you. Speak to our hearts, Lord, we ask, for we pray it in Jesus' name. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was standing in a hot, muggy part of the world that I had never been to before. This was my first trip to a third world country. And as I stood there in front of the airport, I was getting ready to come back to the United States of America. And while I was there in the country of the Philippines, I had seen things that I had never seen before in my life. I had seen poverty like I had never seen it before. I saw generosity like I had never seen it before. I saw contentedness like I had never seen it before. I saw saw things that just radically transformed my life. But one thing that I saw that I will never forget as long as I live was night after night standing in front of the big white tent that was set up where they were having the evangelistic meetings. Myself and my classmates, Christina was one of them, we were helping out with the kids' meetings, and there was another person that was preaching in the seminar night after night. And every night I would stand on the street corner as we were getting ready to go over to the kids' meetings, and I would watch this phenomenon take place. I would watch these trucks pull up. They called them sugarcane trucks. And in the back of these sugarcane trucks, there were people packed in the back of these trucks like sardines. And I would watch one truck after another, after another, pull up to the tent. People would come filing out. They would go inside the tent, and they would sit down on hard bamboo benches for two hours to hear the Word of God preached. Aren't you thankful for your comfortable seat this morning? I know you're saying in your mind, I'm also thankful he's not going to preach for two hours. <laughs> and I watched this phenomenon happen night after night after night. These people just coming, filing in and sitting down and listening to the word of God and absorbing it. And as I stood there in front of the airport, getting ready to come back to the United States of America, this rich experience behind me, thinking to myself, Lord, are there that many people in the world who are hungry for the word of God? A passage of scripture flashed through my young 18-year-old mind. I had just given my heart to the Lord. I was less than a year baptized at this point. And this passage of scripture flashes through my mind. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. You're familiar with it. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then? 
And I remember that passage just came into my mind. And as I'm standing there with this rich experience behind me, I'm thinking to myself, if the gospel has to go to the world before Jesus comes back, then I want to do my part to hasten the coming of Christ. I was not interested in staying any longer in this world than was necessary, even though I was only 18 years old and hadn't had much life experience. But in my young 18-year-old mind, this made sense to me. If I didn't want to spend any longer here on this earth than is necessary, then I needed to be about my father's business. And that was the first inkling of God's calling me into full-time ministry was that trip, that short trip to the country of the Philippines. Well, that was 21 years ago. I've learned a lot in that time, and I've lost a lot of hair in that time as well. But God has taught me a lot. And I want to share with you a few of those things this morning that the Lord has taught to me in our story. About seven years ago, I was sitting in my living room, actually probably about eight years ago, and I had a good friend come over to my house. This friend and I, we had done a lot of evangelism together in various places. And he was coming to share with me how the Lord had laid upon his heart a burden to reach the unreached. Now, I grew up reading stories, you know, the missionary stories, just like you did. And I loved those missionary stories as a child. And we would read some of those books more than once. And he, he began to share with me this burden that he had to reach the unreached. And he, as he was talking, he opened my mind to a part of ministry that I had never really thought much about. I was an evangelist with amazing facts at that time. And I thought that I was doing everything that needed to be done to hasten the coming of Christ. But he opened to my mind that there are approximately 3 billion people in the world who have not even heard the name of Jesus uttered. Now, you want to rattle an evangelist cage, say something like that. And all of a sudden, I began to realize that as an evangelist here in North America, I'm preaching to people who have heard the name of Jesus uttered their whole life. And yet, there's this huge spectrum of people in the world who don't even know that Jesus exists. It just blew my mind. And then he opened his computer, his laptop computer, and he played a three-minute video that transformed my life. And as I sat there and watched these statistics about the need to reach the unreached, and how many people, people groups in the world have never even heard of Christ, and, and the poverty that people live in, and all of these types of things, as I sat there and watched this, I began to tear up. My eyes began to burn as I thought about the people in the far-flung parts of the world who do not have any hope in the gospel and hope in the coming of the Lord. Well, that seed was planted in my heart, and it stayed there for several years and didn't really do a whole lot. We subscribed to the Adventist Frontier magazine during that eight years, and the Lord had led us to a couple of friends who ended up serving as missionaries with Adventist Frontier Missions. And as a pastor, whenever they would come back to North America on their furloughs, I would always schedule them to come to my church and share what the Lord had been doing in the mission field. And so we had talked to them and, and learned more about mission work and what's going on, but really didn't sense that God might be calling us in that direction. I oftentimes thought in my mind, well, I'm not a teacher and I'm not a medical worker. I preach and I do Bible studies, and I didn't feel like that that would be the most uh, usable gifts in the mission field, especially when you think about the Muslim part of the world. And so I kind of just put it to the side and said, well, maybe the Lord will take somebody else over there. But nonetheless, we were fascinated with the unreached part of the world. We read mission stories about great missionaries that would go and just give their life completely to the service of God, Hudson Taylor and men like that. And we were inspired by these stories. But then this past December, something very interesting happened. We were... My wife had been reading the Frontier magazine. She reads it from cover to cover every month. And in the back of that magazine, they had this section called the Top Five Mission Calls. And one of the top five mission calls was to the highlands of Scotland. And they were calling for a pastor. 
And so my wife came up and she said, look at this. Uh, she said, one of the top five mission calls to Scotland and they're calling for a pastor. You are a pastor. Now, my wife grew up, and she wanted to be an Amy Carmichael. You know that she went to the mission field. She never got married. She never had children. She lived with the people. She died with the people. She just did an incredible work overseas. And that's what she wanted to do. But the Lord led her in another direction, and I'm thankful that he led her in my direction. <laughs> I think he did it for my own personal salvation, because it's done so much for me. But look at this, top five mission calls to the highlands of Scotland. And it just so happened that I actually have British citizenship because my stepfather's British. And so it'd be very natural. And she said, look at this, it's very, and I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. And I didn't give it much thought. The next month, she's reading the Frontiers magazine, top five mission calls, highlands of Scotland. Look at this, it's here again, she tells me. Oh, that's very interesting. The next month comes, top five mission calls. This happened for about five months. Now, unbeknownst to me, my wife got her prayer journal out, and she wrote in her prayer journal, Lord, either put this burden on Jason's heart or give me peace about Scotland. Amen. Somebody should say amen about praying wives. Amen. You know, oftentimes as spouses, we oftentimes, we, we kind of, you know, nag at each other, right? You should do this, you should do that, you should do this, you should do that. And we'd be better off if we just went to our knees on it, wouldn't we? And so she prayed this prayer. I didn't know she was praying it. She didn't tell me about it. She just started praying about it. And the Lord began to do a work in my heart that I didn't know much about at that time. Well, December came. We had some friends that came to visit us. They were missionaries with Adventist Frontier Missions. And as they began to share their story with us a little bit more, it just really was inspiring me, Dory. And she's just praying this prayer. Lord, either give me peace or put this burden on Jason's heart. And one morning, I'm sitting in my bedroom and I'm having my morning devotions. You should have your morning devotions if you don't have it. It's a time the Lord wants to speak directly to your heart. And I was going through the Gospels. I was just reading through the Gospels in my morning devotional time. I'd gotten a new Bible, and I had my highlighters, and I was highlighting things and having a good time reading my, my Gospels. And as I was going through the Gospel of Luke, I stumbled across this passage in Luke chapter 11 and verse 9, where the Bible says, you know, uh, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find... Knock, and the door shall be opened to you. And I'm reading... I, I, how many times have I read that Bible passage? Dozens. And as I'm sitting there in my devotional time, and I'm reading this Bible passage, I have this distinct impression. The Lord says, Jason, it's time to start knocking on the doors of missions. Well, not being a person who wants to reject the leading of God in my life, I woke up, and well, after I was done my devotions, I went and I talked with Midori about this, and I said, hey, you know, I feel like the Lord is telling me that I need to start knocking on the door of missions. And I know underneath her breath she's saying, Amen. <laughs> and so, I, don't want to, I didn't want to drag my feet on this, so I went down to my office right after I had breakfast, and I opened up my computer, and I wrote a letter to John Baxter. Any of you have ever heard of John Baxter before? Oh my. You need to look up John Baxter's testimony. He's got a fantastic testimony. He's the recruiter for Adventist Frontier Missions. Anyways, so I write an email to John Baxter. He's a friend of mine. We kind of cross paths every now and then. And I said, hey, I would like more information about the Inverness, Northern, Northern Scotland project. We're interested in possibly looking into, you know, the possibility of going into the mission field. You know, I didn't want to be too committal. And I started doing research and I found out that Scotland, there's only one other place in the world where there's a worse Adventist to population ratio than Scotland, and it's the Middle East. It's a desert of Adventism in Scotland. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Scotland. North of Glasgow, there's no Adventists. Not a single one. Most of the Adventists in Scotland are either Filipino or they're from the Caribbean islands. There are very few indigenous Scottish people, and that kind of thing appeals to the heart of an evangelist. And so I sent off this email and I said, we would like more information about Inverness, about Scotland. Tell us a little bit more about it. He writes me back and he says, well, right now it's very difficult for Americans to get work permits in Scotland. So it would really not probably be something that you'd be able to do. And I wrote him back and I said, I have British citizenship, so this shouldn't be any problem. He writes me back and he says, this is an act of God. Please come down to my office. We need to talk. 
He was only two hours away, and so we said, okay, you know, let's, let's do this. And two days later, we're driving down to Berrien Springs, Michigan, to the office there at Adventist Frontier Missions. We walk in the front door, and, 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 and John Baxter meets us, and he's having a meeting with Con Conrad Vine, the president of Amazing Facts, and Mark Coleman, he's the international field director. The three of them were having a meeting together, and he introduces me to them. He says, this is Jason. He used to be an evangelist with Amazing Facts. He's a pastor here in the Michigan Conference. We're here to talk about missions. And so they say, hey, nice to meet you, whatever. And John says, go down to my office. I'll be down there in a few minutes. We're just going to finish up our meeting here. And unbeknownst to me, when the three of them came together, Conrad Vine, the president of Amazing, or, uh, Adventist Frontier Missions, he said, Jason would be a good fit for the Gogodala project in Papua New Guinea. They're in the process of building a training center there where they want to train the local people. You all are familiar with AFCO, where Chuck just came from, kind of an AFCO-style thing in the middle of the jungle. Okay, given his background in evangelism and pastoring, he would. They, he said he would be a good fit for that. So John Baxter comes down, and we we sit in his office. I'm there with my wife and my kids, and we're talking about missions. And he says, "Have you ever thought about Papua New Guinea?" I said, "Papua New what?" I came there to talk about Scotland, man. I mean, I had have, I have this laser beam focus on Scotland because there's so few Seventh-day Adventists there. It's a desert of Adventism. And I'm, I, you know, I'm focused. He said, Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea. And Midori's like, Papua New Guinea? Oh, yeah, tell us a little bit more about that. And so he begins to tell us about the Papua New Guinea project. And there with the Gogodala people. And I'm thinking to myself, Okay, can we talk more about Scotland here? This is what we came here for. We came to talk about Scotland. And, and, and so we have this great meeting together. We talk about missions. And we end up leaving. And he gives us three folders for three different projects that you know, we might be interested in. And so we go home and we begin to pray. And we begin to pray. And we begin to pray. We pray and we say, I pray. And I say, Lord, please open up the doors for us to go to Scotland. And, you know, Midori was interested in the Papua New Guinea project because... It's a remote place. It's kind of out in the country, country where we can raise our kids. Most of the mission calls now are in the cities, in you know, the, the big metrop metropolitan areas. And you know, we would go there if God called us, but if we can raise our kids in the country, so much better. And so she was interested in it, but I was just, yeah, I wasn't, I, I, I'm okay, Lord, you know, whatever, but please open up the doors for us to go to Scotland. You know, our desires are not always what God's desires are. I prayed for three months and didn't get a single answer from the Lord. Have you ever felt like you're praying to the wall before? I'm a pastor. Pastors are supposed to have some sort of special connection with the Lord, right? And, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, and I'm, it's like nothing. I'm not getting any response from the Lord. It's just silence. And in the midst of that three months, John Baxter comes to our house to visit us. And he's sitting in our living room one day, and we've been talking to our kids about missions that we want to go and serve as missionaries. And they were super excited about that. And we were telling them about different places in the world, and we have this big map on our wall where we would show them the different places in the world. And John Baxter is sitting in our living room, and I'm sitting on the couch, he's sitting on the couch, we're talking together, whatever. And my son, Christian, he jumps up on the couch, and he points to the island of Papua New Guinea. And he says, that's Papua New Guinea, we're going to be missionaries there. John Baxter says, oh, I guess I need to talk to your parents about this. And so we begin to talk, and you know, we're going through lots of questions. He's just trying to get us more acquainted with the concepts of mission work and what it means to be a missionary. And then at the end of our time together, he said, listen, we asked him lots of questions about the, the Gogodala project. He said, let me go back and email Steve and Lori Erickson. They're the missionaries that are there right now. And let me ask them some questions, kind of get a better idea of what's going on over there, and then I'll get back in touch with you and let you know what I find out. Say, so, great, sounds good. I'm praying. Lord, your will be done. Scotland, Scotland would be great. We have family there in, in the UK, so we just thought, yeah, that's a good thing. Anyways, so we're praying. I don't hear anything from John Baxter. Week go by, two weeks go by, three weeks go by, nothing from him. I'm thinking to myself, maybe this is just not where the Lord wants us to be. I get an email from John Baxter. He says, listen, we would like to invite you down to the office for one week of missionary orientation. This is, that's the time where they officially accept you as a missionary and you accept the call as a missionary. And it's also the time that you accept where you're going to go as a missionary. 
And so we're excited, you know, the Lord's just opening doors, all of the paperwork's being processed, there's just no barriers, we're just knocking on one door after another, and the Lord is, the Lord is just flinging these doors open, except for one. Right. The, you guys aren't God, how do you know that? Anyways, so we go down to AFM for our week of orientation. We're going to become missionaries, right? And um, we get down there, and on Monday, the first day of orientation, I asked John Baxter, I said, have you heard anything from Steve and Lori Erickson? He said, no, I haven't heard anything from them. They're super busy right now. They've got this big building project going on. I haven't heard anything from them. I said, okay, well, that's fine. Maybe the Lord just doesn't want us to do this. Maybe he has something else for us. But this is what was happening. As I was praying over those three months, the more I began to pray, the more my heart began to change. And as, I, as my heart was changing, it was going from, from Scotland, 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 Scotland to just this desperation of, Lord, I want you to lead in my life. Just tell me where you want me to go. You know, I don't want to throw a dart on a dartboard and say, that's where I'm going to go. I wanted the Lord to say, this is where I want you to be. Because when it gets tough, you want to know that the Lord led you there. And so over that three months, although I felt like I was praying to a brick wall and I wasn't hearing anything, any of the voice of God, the Lord was massaging my heart and changing it from what my will was to His will. And let me tell you something this morning, brothers and sisters. If there's anything about knowing the will of God, it's resigning your own desires so that you can accomplish His purposes. Because you might have good intentions. They were good intentions. I wanted to go to Scotland as a missionary. Those are good intentions. But God says, I've got something even better for you. Yes. Right? And so as I was praying, the Lord was changing my heart. And over those three months, and I got to that point where I was at orientation. And I was finally at this brick wall. And I said, Lord, I will go wherever you want me to go. Just tell me where you want me to go. And so Monday night comes. We're at home. The next day, Tuesday we have to decide where we're going to serve as missionaries. Nothing like getting down to the wire, right? You know, we like to have everything all planned out ahead of time and know exactly where we're going to go and all that kind of stuff. That's not the way God operates, just in case you were wondering. Okay? And so we're, we're, at the, we're at this 11 o'clock hour, you know, and we're, Monday night we're praying. We put the beds, kids to bed. My wife and I get together, and we've been praying this whole time together, but we just spent a little extra time together praying and asking the Lord, show us what your will is. And my wife said, listen, I want to be like Daniel the prophet. I said, oh, that sounds good. I want to be like Daniel the prophet too. She said, she said, you know, when Daniel prayed in Daniel chapter 2, he didn't stay up all night long. He prayed, they had a prayer session, and then they went to bed, and God revealed it to him in the night vision. Sounds good to me. And so we had this prayer time together. Lord, not my will, but thine be done. And as, I'm, as we're praying, I pray this silent prayer inside my heart. I've been wrestling about praying this prayer. And I said, Lord, if it's your will, if you want us to go to Papua New Guinea, we're fine. that's fine. But if you want us to do that, please have the Ericsons, the missionaries that are over there, contact John Baxter. And that will just be an indicator that you're leading in that direction. And so we prayed and we, we had our final prayer and we went to bed. And while I was sleeping in my bed that night, I had a dream. And in this dream, we had landed in Port Moresby, the capital of Papua New Guinea. And as we walked out of the airplane, Steve and Lori were there to greet us. And I, as, as I'm watching this in my dream, Midori walks up to Lori, the wife, and Lori throws her arms around Midori and gives her a big bear hug. And she's just kind of rocking back and forth. Have you ever seen that before? Right, just, just so excited to see us and to welcome us to P&G, and then I wake up. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm the type of person that has wacko dreams at night. You know, when, when I wake up, I tell my wife about my dreams, and we just kind of laugh together, you know, just these crazy, outrageous things. And so I didn't want to say, I didn't want to put too much into this, so I didn't say anything to Midori. I just I'm just going to leave this. We got up on Tuesday morning, we got our things together, we go down to the AFM office. And we're going through our classes, and the, the, uh, the, the officers at the off, at, uh, at AFM, they're meeting together in a side room talking about placement, where we might be able to serve as missionaries. And we're in our class over here, you know, learning more about being missionaries. 
And so the time comes for us to meet together with the officers about where we're going to serve. And we walk into the office, there's about five or six people sitting around talking about this. They're great people, it wasn't you know, high pressure or anything like that. It was a wonderful experience. But as we walk in, they had this whiteboard and there are about 14 places in the world where they thought we could serve as missionaries. I said, Lord, that's not what I prayed for. I didn't pray for more options. I prayed for a place, just one place. I can't be in two places at once. So we walk in, we've got these 14 places on the board, and they've got it all charted out, you know, where it is in the world, how much it costs to go there, how many languages you have to learn, are they open to public evangelism, are they closed, is it closed access, all these crazy things. And I'm sitting there, and my head is just spinning. So we start going through this, this list, and we start erasing things that just, you know, that's not going to work. I'm not going to learn two tonal languages. That's just not going to happen. I'm 40 years old, and my mind doesn't work that way anymore. And so we're going through this, and we're racing options. On the, and as we're going through it, I looked over at, at uh, John Baxter, and I said, Hey, John, have you heard from Steve and Lori? He said, Yeah, I got an email from them last night. I said, Okay, that's kind of cool. So I didn't say anything. I just said, All right. So we're going through, and it come, we're at lunchtime now. And we've got three options on the board, two in Africa, one in Papua New Guinea. And we break for lunch. And as we're driving home for lunch, I'm telling my wife, Midori, about this dream that I had last night and the prayer request that I prayed. And as we would talk together, we thought, you know, this is not a lightning bolt from heaven, but it's clear that the Lord is leading us in a direction. There's fence posts that the Lord is starting to set up. You know, when you get two fence posts, you know the direction that the fence is going to go. And so we say, okay, let's just go ahead and step out in faith and let's move this direction. If it's not the Lord's will, he'll close the door. And so now our prayer changed from, Lord, where do you want us to go to, Lord, confirm this call? Okay, so we come back to the office after lunch. We meet with John Baxter and we say, we feel like the Lord is leading us in the direction of Papua New Guinea. He says, great, let's start processing the paperwork and let's move that direction. Amen. So we go to our next class and the teacher of the next, next class, guess where she served as a missionary? So we talked for like a half an hour about what it's like to be a missionary in Papua New Guinea. I thought, wow, that's, this is fascinating. The next person we meet with is a missionary to Papua New Guinea. That night, my wife fires off an email to her family saying that we had accepted a call to serve as missionaries to Papua New Guinea. Her uncle emails her back. And he says, I wish, I had always wished as a young person that, or now, he said, I wish that I had gone as a missionary to Papua New Guinea. I'm so glad that you guys are going over there as missionaries. He has since given us $10,000 towards our launching goal. Well, it's like the Lord is, you know, he's kind of confirming calls here. But here's where things get very interesting. Steve and Lori's daughter was just about to get married. This was April, this past April. Their daughter was going to get married in May. So in April, we're at the AFM office going through orientation. I knew that they were coming to the States for their daughter's wedding. I thought, well, it'd be nice to be able to meet them. So right after we accept the call to Papua New Guinea, I'm surfing Facebook, and I noticed that Lori is in an airport. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. It's kind of early for her to be coming over here. But nonetheless, you know, that's interesting. Just kind of took note of that. John Baxter had emailed them and said, hey, the Sligers have accepted a call to come and work with you in the Gogadala project. She emails back, oh, that's so great. We're looking forward to meeting you, blah, blah, blah. And that was it. Friday morning, I'm sitting in the office. We're in our last class, and I open up my computer, bing, and an email pops up. It's from Lori Erickson. And I open it up, and she says, hey, I'm in Berrien Springs. Are you guys still here? That's where the AFM office is. It's in Berrien Springs. And I emailed her back. I said, yeah, we're still here at Berrien Springs. It's so great to hear that. We would love to meet you. She said, great, let's meet. So we email back and forth. Literally, our schedules overlap for 15 minutes. For 15 minutes. The Lord brought her all the way from Papua New Guinea and me from Michigan down to Berrien Springs so that our schedules could overlap for 15 minutes. So our classes end, and we're standing there in the office, we're waiting for Lori to show up. And my wife and I are talking, blah, 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 and then all of a sudden we see Lori come, come across, and her daughter's with her. They walk through the front door, and Midori walks through the side door to go and say hello to them. And I'm walking behind her, and as, as, as Midori goes through that door and meets Lori, guess what happens? 
How did you know? Now, I didn't set this up. I wasn't planning it this way, right? But I'm walking behind me, Dory. And as I'm looking in front of me, Lori comes in and she throws her arms around me, Dory. And she's rocking back and forth. And I'm looking into Lori's face and she's crying. And I can hear me, Dory, going. And I know that she's crying. And I'm thinking to myself, I've seen this before somewhere. And so we're praying, Lord, confirm the call. If you want us to go, confirm the call. Just keep confirming this thing for us. And the Lord does this miraculous confirmation there on our last day at the AFM office. But of course, oh ye of little faith, you need more evidence, right? So Tuesday, the next week, I'm sitting in bed and I've got my Bible out. And I'm having my devotions. And I'm praying and I'm, uh, you know, I've just made this life transformation decision, right? We're going to fling ourselves to the other side of the world with three kids out in the middle of the jungle. And I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, you got to help me with this. And I'm looking at the money that we need to raise to go to the mission field. Papua New Guinea is the second most expensive place in the world that AFM sends missionaries. It's so expensive to serve as a missionary there. It requires a lot of money. It takes $5,000 just to get from the mission compound to Port Moresby, the capital of the city, the capital of the country. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, this is a lot of money. I don't have it. Where are we going to get all this money from? And I'm praying and I'm talking to the Lord about our launching goal and our monthly goal. And I'm just thinking, Lord, you've got to help us with this. And as I'm praying to the Lord, he brings into my mind Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your needs. And so I get my Bible out and I, I underline that Bible passage. And just like the great George Mueller's of old, I take my finger and I put my finger on that promise. And I say, Lord, you said that you would provide all my needs. I'm putting it on your lap. You take care of it. Amen. Amen. Four hours later, I'm walking down my driveway with my trash can behind me, taking my trash out. And I get to the end of my driveway, I put my trash can down, and I walk over to my mailbox, and I open my mailbox. And I, you know, I did this all the time. I'd open my mailbox and throw away my junk mail and take the rest of the stuff, you know? I open my mailbox, there's one envelope in there. Do you ever have just one envelope in your mailbox? I never have just one envelope in my mailbox. There's always tons of stuff in there. There's one envelope in there. And I pull the envelope out, and it says 3ABN across the top. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, this is probably promotional material. But then I noticed that our address was handwritten and it was addressed to Midori Sliger. I get, well, I better not throw my wife's mail away. So I open up the letter there standing at the end of the driveway. We open up each other's mail. You know, it's kind of an open relationship here. So I open it up <laughs> and I pull out the letter. Midori's grandmother had just died about three months prior to this at the age of 103. Thank the Lord for the Adventist health message. Amen. Amen. So I open up the letter and I read it, and it's from 3ABN. It says, your grandmother had a trust with 3ABN, and we are settling that trust, and you will be getting money in the amount of $7,500. Wow. Wow. Now, have you ever seen those, those situations where it just, you read something and it just kind of echoes? And I'm standing there at the end of my driveway, four hours after claiming that promise, my God shall supply all your needs. Four hours later, I'm standing there and I have 7,500 bucks in my hand. And I think to myself, how did the Lord work out the timing on this thing? Right, you know, I mean, this letter must have been sent the week before, when we were still at AFM, before we had even met Lori. How did the Lord work out the timing with Midori's grandmother passing away? We don't want people to pass away, but he worked out the timing on that. And it all converged down to that moment when I'm standing there after I claimed that promise that God would supply all our needs, and I'm standing there with 7,500 bucks in my hand. And I, tell you, I, go back to my, I go back to my house, and I open up my Bible, and I stick that letter, bam, right there in Philippians. And I go over to Midori, and I say, here, read the Bible passage, highlight it, and then read the letter. Amen. And I thought to myself, this has got to be God. Yes. God is working in our lives. And so we begin to pray. And we say, Lord, you are confirming this call. Continue to confirm it to build up our faith. And so we, have, we begin to pray. We had three things that, were, that, had, that we had assets in. Okay? We had our house, we had a car, and we had an old vintage Airstream trailer that we used at camp meeting time. I felt impressed 
that in order to get to the mission field as soon as possible, I had to resign my position as a pastor and throw myself into full-time fundraising so that I could get over there. Fundraising and pastoring just didn't seem to mix in my mind. You wouldn't like it if your pastor was gone every weekend, would you? Oh, you got really quiet there, didn't you? So I felt like I have to resign my, my position as a pastor so that I can throw myself into this. So the end of June, I canceled my employment just this past June. And I'm saying, okay, Lord, we've got these three assets. Please sell these three assets so that we can survive while we're fundraising. Okay, so we start praying. These three things, praying about selling them, okay? One Sabbath, I had notified my congregation that we had accepted this call to go to Papua New Guinea. One Sabbath, I'm standing in the gym after potluck, and I'm talking with one of my church members. And she says, you know, the last pastor... When, when he left, he had a little kind of like yard sale and members bought things from him and then he donated the money to some project. He said, she said, you should do something like that and you can raise some money for your mission project. I said, that's a great idea. We've got lots of things that we need to get rid of because we can't take it all with us to the mission field. And I mentioned things that we needed to get rid of and one of the things that I mentioned was our Prius car. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, there was a church member standing right next to her. She said, I'll buy your car. I said, you what? She said, I'll buy your Prius. I said, you'll buy my Prius? She said, yeah, I'll buy your Prius. So I'm like, hang on a second. So I walk around the corner and into the kitchen where she's standing, because we were talking through a window. And I said, you want to buy my Prius? She said, yeah, I've been praying about buying your Prius. I said, let me get this straight. You've been praying about buying my Prius? He said, yeah. I said, that's interesting because we've been praying about selling our Prius. <laughs> and so I tell people, we sold our Prius on the Sabbath. <laughs> the Lord sold the Prius on the Sabbath. <laughs> and so that's, that's gone. One asset, boom, it's gone. God has sold it. Now, we, you know, we're going to have a little extra cash when that comes through. So we're continuing to pray. We've got this trailer and we've got this house. Lord, please work this out. And so... The summer comes, we get through camp meeting, we don't need a trailer anymore, we get it all nice and spick and span, and we put it on Facebook Marketplace. And before we know it, boom, it's gone. Praise the Lord, the Lord is selling our stuff. Now we've got this house that is full of stuff. Do you have one of those? It seems like the bigger your house gets, the more stuff you get, and you know, it's just... Ugh. We have all this stuff, and I'm like, there's no way it's going to go with us. We've got to get rid of this stuff. And so the Lord opens up doors, and there's this family who's in ministry, who's never had a house, and they're finally building their first house, but they don't have the money to furnish it. I said, praise the Lord. We're getting rid of a house, and we need to get rid of our furnishings, and we don't want to sell it. Here, you can have it. Amen. And so they come over, and they take load after load after load after load of stuff, and now their house is furnished, and ours isn't. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And so we put our house on the market, and guess what? Next week, it's going to close. Amen. God sold our three assets, and he sold that house for more than what we thought we were going to get for it. Amen. So the Lord is confirming this call in our minds. Well, let me just back up just a little bit. So we're sitting in our house. We're getting ready to you know, move out. Okay, A lot of our stuff has left. Our living room set's gone. Our kitchen, our kitchen table's gone. Our beds are leaving. I mean, just our house is getting emptier and emptier and emptier. And we're sitting in our kitchen, in our dining room kitchen, at a folding card table. You know those rickety things? And we got folding chairs, and, and we're sitting there, and the kids are losing their minds. Okay, It's just chaos in our house. And I'm sitting there, and we're talking to each other, trying to figure life out. And my phone rings. And so I look at my phone, and it's from uh, Jim Mitchiff, the conference president there at Michigan. So, you know, you don't hit silent on that phone call, do you? You know, you go... You... So I pick up my phone, and I answer it, and I, I walk out the side door to get out of the chaos. And I say, hello, how are you? And he says, hey, how are your things going? Things are going great. You know, things are always going great when you talk to the conference president. Things are going great. And he's like, well, listen... He said, I've got the, the conference treasurer here, and we want to talk to you about something. I said, okay, that sounds good. Let's, let's talk. So he said, listen, we have, it's come to our attention that over the last three years, we have not paid you the right amount of money. I said, that's very interesting. Maybe that's why I had a... 
hard time paying some of my bills. God always provided, though. He said, it's come to our attention that we have not paid you the correct amount for the past three years, and we want to make that right. And you will be getting a check for the amount of $18,000. I said, do you have any idea how much $18,000 is going to help somebody who doesn't have a job? He said, we're glad that we can do that. And I was just like, I hung up the phone and I thought to myself, three years ago, the Lord opened up a savings account for me. Yes. Exactly. And I had no idea. What had happened was we moved from one district to another and they didn't adjust the cost of living amount. And so there was this money that was accruing. And then right before we end up getting off the road, the Lord brings a new conference treasurer to the office who's this amazing guy and he happens to find the inconsistency. No, 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 no. He doesn't happen to find it. The Lord reveals it to him. And I'm standing there on my porch. My life is, I feel like my life is unraveling. Like, what have I done? I'm like, I'm not, I'm not providing for my family. I don't have a job. And, and then the Lord gives me this phone call. And he's like, don't worry. I got things under control. And so the Lord is just giving us one confirmation after another that we are moving in the right direction. And then the, one of my members brings back to my memory something that I'd said in one of my sermons. I've been reading a lot about different missionaries just prior to us accepting this call. And I would share these stories. We hadn't, I hadn't you know, thought that we were going to be going into the mission field. I was just genuinely interested in it. And so I would incorporate missions into my sermons. And I was preaching a sermon. And the story that I was telling was about George Mueller. You know, that great man of faith. This, if you've never read his story, you need to read it. George Mueller, he, man, he would pray and God would move for him. And I remember telling the story one Sabbath morning about George Mueller. And it was not in my notes. I hadn't thought about it. It was completely off the cuff. But I said to my church congregation, I am sick and tired of reading stories like this. I want to experience it. You know, it's nice to read these incredible answers to prayer and all of these mission stories and how God moves mightily in the lives of other people. That's so faith building. And I would read, I read probably a dozen books and I thought to myself, I'm tired of reading this. I want to have this experience. Amen. Amen. And it's, my church member says, well, pastor, I guess you're having those experiences now. <laughs> and it's almost like as soon as I cut every earthly tie, then God said, okay, now I can start providing for And you know, it's been difficult, but I would never in a million years trade the experience that I've had over the past six months. Amen. I can tell you story after story how God has just miraculously showed us that we are going in the direction that he's called us. And there's nothing more satisfying in your spiritual life than knowing that you are right dab smack in the center of God's will. Amen. And so... Lord willing, next fall, a year from now, we will be on a plane heading towards the island of Papua New Guinea. We've never been there. We don't know what it's like. But by God's grace, we will be moving that direction at that time to help in the running of this training center that is currently being built right now. A week ago, I was in the country of Thailand with my wife. We were up in the northern mount north western mountains of Thailand near Mesot. And we were helping out with a series of revival meetings that um, this lady Gail is doing. And as we, were, as we were there for that week, we just were so impressed with this, this, this woman of God. Ten years ago, her life unraveled. One Christmas morning, her husband said, I have a girlfriend. Not the Christmas gift you want to get, is it? And her life just falls apart. Her husband leaves her. She falls into this deep depression. And she just feels like, what am I doing in life? And then she gets a phone call. We need somebody to help here in Thailand with a, for a missionary that's coming back for a three-month furlough. Would you come and cover that three-month furlough? She goes to Thailand for three months and she never comes back. She's still there right now. She's a modern-day Eric B. Hare, if you've ever heard of him before. She's a nurse that's ministering to the needs of the people there. And as I sat in her little clinic, 
in the middle of the jungle, literally, this is a jungle, bamboo floors, bamboo huts, thatched roof, fires, you know, people who still believe in witch doctors and wear, uh, you know, devil strings around their neck and believe all this craziness. As I was sitting there listening to her stories, it was so incredibly faith building that somebody like her, she couldn't weigh more than 100 pounds dripping wet, would step out in faith and say, my God shall supply all my needs. I'm going to do my father's bidding and let him take care of the rest. And it was so inspiring to me to know that God is sitting on his throne and he wants to do big things for us. And I want to appeal to you this morning, God has a will for you, and it doesn't always mean making money. The great American dream, right? Get a bigger paying job, have a bigger house, live in a more prestigious area, buy more things. The great American dream. God has a plan for you, and maybe it is for you to finance some of the mission work that's being done in the world. Maybe that's part of God's plan. If it is... Do it well. But I want to appeal to you this morning. Don't be satisfied with a mediocre Christian experience. Amen. Oh, yes. I pray that you will become tired of reading those stories. Yes. And that you will yearn for that experience yourself. Because when you have experiences like that, that are your own experience, it builds your faith in God in an incredible way you realize that there is a God who is interacting with you on a personal level. See, here in America, we have kind of insulated ourselves. We provide all of our own needs, and it's almost like we don't need God in America. And I pray that God would cut cut those strings in your life so you have to lean a little harder on Him. Because when you do, it's such a sweet experience to see Jesus work on your behalf. Tis so sweet, that's right, brother. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. It's wonderful to have that experience. So that's our story. I know that it's going to continue to grow. There's more to it. This afternoon at 2 o'clock, right after potluck, we're going to be right back in here, and I'm going to share a little bit more about why we have chosen to go to the place that we are going in the world. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a good presentation, not because I'm doing it, but because it's interactive and it's informative. You really don't want to miss it. By the way, you don't have anything else going on this afternoon, right? Nobody's going to work or anything like that. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Amen. I always wonder to myself, why do, ad, why do American Adventists, are, why do they leave the church in such a rush? It's like, man, where are you going? Just fellowship together and enjoy that time. Amen? amen. Press together, press together. Enjoy that time together in Christian fellowship. So that'll be this afternoon at 2 o'clock. We'll share a little bit more about that. But this morning as we close, I want to pray that God would give you a deeper experience with Him. Amen. Amen. How many of you want that? Let's pray for that this morning. Father in heaven, what a mighty God you are. Lord, we thank you so much that you, this great God who sits on a great throne in heaven, who creates every living thing and sustains them, that this God wants to personally interact with my life. What an incredible privilege, Lord. And Father, I'm fearful that we're missing out on this deeper experience with you because we're satisfied to supply our own needs. Father, I pray for the members of this precious church that you would bless them as they step out in faith and sacrificially support the cause of God, whether it be here or in distant lands. That you would bless their influence. That you would give them greater and greater experiences with you that they would see collectively that you are working on their behalf. Lord, you've done it before. You've put this church here for a reason. You've blessed the members of this church, Lord. And I pray that you would continue to do just that and that they would be a light in their community that cannot be extinguished. Pray for their pastor, that you would bless Chuck and his family as they faithfully serve you in this part of the mission field, that you would give him wisdom as he leads, that you would bless the leaders of this church, the board members who cast the vision 
of moving forward and completing the work that you've called us to do. Father, may you give us that deeper experience with you where God becomes real in our lives. We thank you for what you are doing and that you want to bring this work to a swift end. May you bless us, Lord, as we unite together with you in that work. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.